I call this meeting to order at 6 p.m. Board clerk, will you call the roll, please? Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. I will begin with Director Gould. Present. Or Zally. Here. Wood. Here. Sheets. Here. Kelly. Present. Jones. Here. White. Here. Clark. Present. And Director Sailors, turning it over to you. Thank you very much. Now we will say the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic of which it stands, one nation, the Metro Cable announcement. The open session meeting is videotaped for cable cast on Metro Cable 14. Replay on Sunday, June 12th at 3 p.m. and Monday, June 13th at 12 noon on Channel 14. Webcast at metro14live.sacccounty.net. Can everyone hear me in the back back there? Good job. Um, we have removed action item number four tonight from that from the action items. We now have public opportunity to discuss matters of public interest within this district jurisdiction, including items on or not on the agenda. Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers tonight? I have no speakers in person. And Art, if you could unmute everyone. Just unmuting everyone, giving them a moment. Okay. Hello, attendees. You now have the ability to unmute yourself if there's anything you'd like to present to the board at this time. Like no takers. <clears throat> Thank you. Having no speakers, we now move on to the consent items. Do we have any questions? If we don't, can I get a motion and a second, please? I so move. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Director Gould. Aye. Where's Allie? Aye. Wood. Aye. Chief. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones? Aye. White? Aye. Clark? Aye. And Sailors? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to action items. The first action item is the fiscal year 2022-23 preliminary budget. CFO Dave O'Toole. What do you have for us tonight? <laughs> Good evening. I have a uh, preliminary budget for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Madam Chair and Board Members, uh, Chief Harms, um, before I get started, and Chief Harms would like to make a few remarks. Sure. Thank you, Dave. Uh, good evening, Directors. Tonight we have uh, two of the action items that I'll talk about. One is the uh, preliminary budget for fiscal year 22-23, and then the capital improvement program, which is um, uh, kind of new, but we, not new, it's, it's what we have done, but we have taken and put a lot of work in it over the last few years for um, being able to move that forward in a more consistent manner. Um, a number of items in the 22-23 budget. Um, I want to first compliment Dave and his team and that everybody that has worked on the preliminary budget coming forward. This is truly Dave's now his budget that, uh, that he gets to go through and manage and, and he had from his experience a lot of uh, input on the uh, processes that we use to be able to get to where we're at today. Um, uh, we are below budget uh, starting off the year, which I think is a good position to be in. Uh, we were able to take some funding and put it back into what we would say is reserves that we had borrowed out of uh, this year's budget to make sure that we were in a position not to go over budget. So a couple of good things there. Um, one of the other items that is in there that we've looked at, and, and especially over the last couple of years, is that there is a couple of new positions uh, that are in the budget and, and some upgrades. And as we went through and we looked at the workload in some of the different areas, and an example of that is the um, training has a new captain that will go in at mid-year, and then there's a uh, captain's position that is in the, um, the helicopter program that would start in mid-year, a, a CQI manager that is back in there. So again, looking at workload, looking at the, the, where we're at as a district, and then looking at that five-year plan as we move forward, those things are in there. 
Um, on the other presentation, which is the capital improvement uh, program, uh, both Dave and uh, Jeff Fry um, and Aaron really over the last year or so had looked at our program and then said, how can we take what we do and what we've done in the past, but how can we make it more transparent? How do we look at all the different items, list all the different items, uh, and really be able to bring that forward to the fire chief and the exec staff for moving forward. So I'm very happy uh, with both the um, initial preliminary budget that we're bringing forward, and then really happy with what we have done with the capital improvement program that will be presented second to you all. So Dave, why don't you take it away? Thank you. Okay, hey, so for tonight, here's uh, for the preliminary, preliminary budget briefing agenda. We've got these eight items. Um, a good place to start would be kind of revisiting where we are today. That's the mid-year. So we'll, we'll go back to the, um, we'll start with an update on the mid-year budget. Then we'll move on to the, an overview of the preliminary budget and then drill down to the general fund revenues, expenditures, and then the, the other funds involved, fund conditions. Um, this presentation includes a long-term forecast. We'll be looking five years out as well. And uh, quick tie-in to the CIP, of course, the CIP is a separate agenda item, so we'll go into that more deeply then, and then, of course, time for questions. So uh, beginning with the current year budget, uh, with the actions you took on March 10th, uh, the 12.4 million general fund shortfall was corrected and remains corrected. Um, the shortfall had a number of causes, but to pick just three that stood out would be uh, 3 million in ground emergency medical transport revenues that were deferred to 2223, uh, which incidentally I'll talk more later, but we have uh, more assurances on the timing of that, and that is built into the budget now. Um, and 8.6 million in extra constant staffing costs, which are the suppression overtime costs uh, uh, for a position that's unable to, to serve their shift, and 2.8 million in increased services and supplies. Uh, also worth mentioning uh, that the COVID funding tap, if you will, uh, did not was not uh, was not uh, uh, did not flourish for us. We received just nine hundred thousand in COVID after the final budget was adopted in September, uh, which um, didn't help us as we were trying to close that budget gap. Um, it's also important to note that the change in the IGT program, where a delay by the state and uh, and federal program administrators pushed the program funding out. Um, into the next year. So we, we did not have $8 million available uh, when we were balancing the mid-year budget that we might otherwise have had. And, and that was part of the reason why we did have to make transfers from other funds. Mm -hmm. uh, the most important update of all is that the solutions appear to be working, as I said, uh, funds available and income is holding above expenditures for this fiscal year. And so with that, we'll move on to the preliminary budget overview. Uh, the 2022-23 preliminary budget has essentially a balance for the general fund with budgeted expenditures and transfers roughly equal to expected revenues and transfers in. Uh, the 2.1 million transferred from the general fund to close the mid-year shortfall, as mentioned, uh, will be repaid. Uh, we anticipate 6.6% projected property tax growth, which equates to about 11.6 million in uh, increase over the current year budget as we passed in the mid-year. Uh, Medic cost recovery is projected to grow by 1.4 million and IGT will continue for another year and generate a net 8.7 million. <clears throat> All labor costs are projected to grow by just shy of 1 million, uh, which there's a lot going on underneath that figure, which I'll, I'll get to in a later slide. Uh, the preliminary budget does not reflect any changes to the terms of the district's current labor agreements, uh, which expire in December 31. And finally, the projected year on reserve is 13%, which is up for the 12.5% we uh, had after the mid-year adjustments, but of course, below the 50% we typically target and uh, strive for. We'll revisit the reserve level again when we do the final budget in, in August and September. Uh, looking at general fund revenue, a familiar uh, slide to all of you. Uh, this is 10 years, 10 consecutive years of property tax growth and the 12th consecutive year of total revenue growth. Uh, property tax revenues as a share of general fund revenues has declined by about 5% since 2010-11. And you can see that, um, you can see how the, the blue is expanding so where other revenues are making a, a larger share of it. Uh, and that includes a lot of that is EMS revenues and IGT transfers. Uh, total projected general fund revenues in the budget year will be 255 million, which is 6.2% higher than the current year. <clears throat> And looking at some numbers, uh, these are on page 22 of your preliminary budget, if you have it handy. Uh, this provides kind of the biggest picture of the proposed budget. Each of the revenues is listed, or uh, the funds is listed at the top, and then your revenues, expenditures, and other financing uh, on the left side of the page there. 
And the, uh, the first column of numbers is the general fund. There's that 255 million in to total revenues I just mentioned. And a uh, circle below that, the uh, expenditures, 256 million. And all the way down at the bottom is the change in fund balance, which you get in by, uh, which you get get to by adding the uh, net total transfers, uh, total transfers, net transfers, uh, which is 3.7 million positive. So you end up with a change in fund balance of just under 2.2 million. There's that 2.17 I mentioned. Uh, in the capital facilities fund, you see expenditures of almost 12.7 million. That's the next fund over, and um, which are covered by lease financing, the sale of an asset, a former fire station property and 5 million transfer from the general fund uh, for a net balance of 316,000. Uh, we'll talk more about the funds in later detail, but if you go all the way to the right on that slide, uh, your total revenues are 276 million for all funds and uh, expenditures 280, uh, almost 281. Um, and the last circled at the bottom right is your, your balance of all funds of 3.3 million. <coughs> Next, we are going on to mid-year and preliminary. So this table is comparing the mid-year and preliminary with the variance at the right. So uh, all general fund. Um, starting with property taxes, the row circle at the top of the long oval expected re tax revenues in 22-23 are 187.3 million. Uh, that's an 11.6 million or 6.6% increase I mentioned previously. Look at the next oval down where you have your um, uh, uh, adding revenue sources altogether, like charges for services provided, including um, medic fees, total revenues will climb 67 million to 254 million. Uh, the proposed budget reflects a modest increase in labor costs, just 1 million, as I said before. Um, but underneath that is a 4.9 million increase in wages associated with most recent labor agreements and 4.8 million increase in CalPERS pension costs. And those two costs are substantially offset by things like the, um, the return to um, a more of a historical average of constant staffing. We're anticipating that going down substantially by what 7.6 million. And um, uh, I, as a uh, as a reference point, uh, the labor costs in 22-23 will actually be 18.5 million greater than they were two years ago. So the one million is kind of a is a is a is an adjusted going up one year from the current years is. Uh, seems pretty modest, but if you take another year look, you can see that labor costs are, are still growing substantially over a longer term. Uh, with services and supplies, they're rising by 2.2 million, which I'll talk about on a later slide, and the total expenditures is, is increased by 3.2 million. Uh, factoring in transfers, the balance circled again is, is 2.2 million, which is a positive swing of 4.2 million uh, from the mid-year. <clears throat> Here's a uh, table. Just briefly uh, shows the makeup of general fund revenues, taxes and charges for services make up 94.6% of revenues. Uh, that 8.7 million operating transfer is the IGT transfer. And uh, let's see, the intergovernmental tr transfers of 4.3 million includes RDA residual distributions and pass-throughs as well as homeowner, homeowner property tax revenues. And more on general fund revenues. Um, uh, as mentioned, the district expects to get a 6.6% increase in property tax revenue. Uh, medic cost transport revenues uh, are reverting to closer to pre-pandemic levels, about 2% a year. And uh, as a, the good news on the GMT, um, which is the program where we receive partial state reimbursement for medic transports of Medi-Cal beneficiaries. Uh, recently, the state department that administers the program shared that we would begin to receive payments uh, for the next three, uh, for, sorry, for the last three years, um, starting this fall. That's 2018-19 through 2020-21. And then uh, we, uh, we expect to also receive the 21-22 funding, although that's not built into the budget because we haven't quite figured out the timing yet. But of course, we'll be back with the final to, uh, to resolve that um, in the final budget. And net IGT revenues are down slightly from last year, about 700,000 uh, to at 8.7 million. And the State Department of Healthcare Services advised us to expect changes to that program uh, this year. So we're kind of getting through those, but the, the reduction is based on an anticipated lower uh, involvement by uh, managed care plans. This next slide, now we're going from revenues to expenditures and still staying with the general fund. Uh, labor costs are still a big part of Metro Fire's budget, 82.2%. And service and supplies, just 14.1%. Going over to, to labor costs, 
Uh, as mentioned earlier, there's a, it's a $214 million labor budget up 1. million compared to the mid meteor and 18.5 million higher than 2020, 2021. Uh, with the labor budget, wage, wages within that labor budget will grow by 7.4%, which reflects things like the 4% negotiated uh, wage increase, new positions and natural wage growth through things like promotions. Uh, pension contributions will tick up by 4.8 million. Um, and if you recall that the, the windfall market tax return, market returns that, pens, that PERS enjoyed, uh, they take two years to be phased in, so we won't see those till next year. Uh, medical premiums will rise 6.9% or 1.1 million. Uh, let's see, constant staffing will go down by 7.6 million. Uh, PERS OPEP contributions, unlike those pension contributions I just mentioned, those are phased in after one year. Uh, the, the market changes are phased in after one year instead of two. So we'll actually see a $2.2 million increase, sorry, decrease in our uh, OPEP contributions this year. Uh, so we got some savings there. Uh, and then reflecting the decline in COVID cases, we expect workers' comp claims to subside down to uh, savings of 770000 Service and supplies budget, $36.8 million, uh, just $2.2 million over what was approved in the mid-year budget. Uh, liability insurance premiums are rising again by about 746,000. Education and training is going up mainly because uh, we're expecting staff to catch up on some of those trainings that were deferred during the pandemic. And uh, there's some inflationary and supply chain pressures sprinkled through the service and supplies budgets too. Uh, vehicle maintenance is going up by 231,000, computer services by 142,000. Uh, moment on debt service assessments and contributions. Uh, we'll pay the county 1.9 million for property tax administration this year. Uh, we actually, uh, a little preview of what's to come. We expect that number to go up substantially as they are phasing in a new property tax IT system. Um, we'll have more to report on that probably uh, in September. Um, we'll also make a $1.9 million payment to the state for the GMT uh, QAF program, an expense that gets offset by Medicare reimbursements through EMS. And the general fund uh, debt service payments on lease revenue bonds total 259,000 reflecting a savings of 53,000, mainly due to the re uh, recently executed lease revenue bond uh, refinancing. Uh, going to general fund transfers, um, very briefly, uh, there's a $5 million transfer to the capital facilities fund and it's offset by an 8.7 million transfer from the IGT fund. The IGT fund is really uh, Practically speaking, it's more of a short-term placeholder for transfers to the general fund. It's not really a surplus fund. All right, moving on to other funds, capital facilities fund. Uh, really have little, if any, revenues generated here. The major expenditure here is the lease revenue bond retirement in 21-22, which is reflected as a special item offset, uh, negative 8.1 million circled at the bottom of the first, uh, second column there. Uh, 7.4 million of the 7.5 million in capital outlay is expected to be financed with the difference already having been financed in the prior year. <clears throat> uh, the remaining capital expenditures and debt service payments are funded with a $5 million transfer from the general fund, as previously mentioned. Uh, uh, and so what is that 7.5 million getting spent on? On page 28 of your preliminary budget has the all of the items in detail, but the probably the three main ones that you notice right away are five type one engines at 4.2 million, nine ambulances at 2.4 million, and the copter conversion at 750,000. Moving on to the grant fund, just briefly, 21-22 was an extraordinary year for grants, and kind of into, we're budgeting for, uh, for grants to come back to earth, if you will. Uh, total grant revenue is expected to shrink by 1.5 million, and expenditures on the grant side will, increase, will decrease by uh, 1.6 million. Factoring in transfers, the expected balance is 555,000. On the leased properties funds, uh, leased revenues are expected at approximately 1.1 million for the, for the budget year, and about the same as last year. And expenditures are uh, expected to drop to, by about 571,000, with a, leaving a projected balance of 488,000, uh, which constitutes a partial payback of the 1.2 million that was uh, transferred in the mid-year budget. In the long-term forecast, um, so this is not in your budget, the long-term forecast, but it's presented here as information to look ahead and kind of what to expect. Um, so I'm going to talk for a minute about the assumptions in there. The, uh, uh, this is, uh, this is the budget year plus five years. So we go all the way out to 27, 28. Uh, some of the important assumptions that were used in the forecast were on the revenue side. 
the uh, we used property tax consultants uh, our property tax consultants numbers through 2627 and then ex extended them out an additional year based on their chun data uh, igt it did not include any change in igt just held it flat at 8.7 through the um, uh, through the forecast period last year we treated it the same way we just held it flat um, expenditures we assumed a one percent growth a, uh, one percent increase in salaries uh, last year we didn't increase any at all but we should just add some in um, uh, and then we recall that labor costs are 82.2 percent of the budget and wages are alone are 28 percent of that budget so the projection can look very different as you layer on percentages and, and wages as you might imagine um, pension cost share between employer and employee doesn't change. It's the same as last year. Uh, didn't change the shares there. Uh, let's see, inflation did change. Last year we're using just 2% through the entire growth period. Uh, this time we're using 7.3% in 2223, uh, which is based on Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers. And then stepping that down 7.3 to 6.3 uh, annually uh, through the, the, the rest of the forecast, 1% a year until it gets down to 2%. Uh, the borrowing rate also needed to adjust that quite a bit too. Uh, it was at 2% uh, last year. Now we are increased it to 4.5% in 22, 23 and 23, 24, and then gradually stepping it down by about a half point as we anticipate that some of the, the, the Fed actions will uh, to uh, bring more control into the market will happen we'll, and we'll, we'll see more, uh, we'll see rates come down uh, but in a few years. Um, yeah, and the the, the uh, bond rates climbed to 3.1% in early May. We expect at least two more half percent uh, increases um, planned by the Fed. So that's how we came up with those projections. So with those assumptions, let's take a look at the the charts. Uh, the first forecast chart shows a revenues expenditures overview starting in 1516 and going all the way out to 2728. Uh, the green bar is revenues, the red bar is expenditures. Notice in the middle, the first circle, that's, that's uh, the current year, 2122. Um, and you can see that the red bar is slightly above, and that's um, uh, uh, that reflects what happened in the, the mid-year, and that uh, we made a transfer from the general fund to make that align. Um, we had to make a transfer to the general fund to make that align. Um, and then next year, our budget year, uh, also circled shows the reverse. Reven revenues are again exceeding expenditures and following that trend through the forecast period. Uh, with a widening gap. Uh, the widening gap between revenues and expenditures is helped by an assumption of a strong property tax growth, um, about 4% going out after this 6.6% uh, year. And if, the, of course, if that growth reverses, something that happens to the economy, it starts to look very different uh, quickly. Uh, on the revenue side, uh, this is a general fund revenues and transfers in slide. Uh, it shows the data starting in 2014 15 again. The dark blue vertical bars are property taxes, you know, still climbing up as mentioned. And the green bars are charges for services growing up more, mo growing more modestly than property taxes, but still, still about 2% on those. So going over to the expenditure forecast for general fund, uh, this slide shows the expenses over the same period as the revenue chart we just saw. Uh, notice that wages, which are in red, are slow growing in the forecast period while the cost of benefits in blues continues to expand. Uh, pension obligation bonds this is a, an important one to see because you can see at the right, uh, the in 25, 26, uh, you've got your last payments and then 26, 27, there is no pension bond payments to make, uh, which will be important in the, in the next slide. Um, to right there. This is your uh, forecast of general fund reserves. So the uh, the the green line is fifteen percent, but you can read all the way over the right. So it's your your your, your bar to, to if you're tracking fifteen percent as our target, and then red is historically where we've been. So we were under it for a while. We got up to it, and then dip back down in twenty one twenty two, and expect it to climb out. Uh, that first circle is the twelve and a half percent. The second circle is the thirteen percent we currently have built into our preliminary budget. Um, if the forecast holds, the 15% is nearly required in uh, 24, 25, and then climbs out from there pretty, pretty substantially. Um, if you're probably wondering why is that, a big part of that would be the POB uh, payments going away and uh, not having that commitment on our budget would enable us to accrue a pretty uh, healthy reserve rather quickly. So 
a comment on the CIP. I just want to mention that the CIP, everything we're going to uh, discuss in the CIP is integrated into the preliminary budget. So the numbers tie um, and that's the way it was designed. <laughs> so before questions, um, let's see, the budget for 22-23 uh, as well as projections for future years uh, will continue to be refined as more information is known. Of course, we expect to come back with the final budget um, in uh, to the uh, Finance and Audit Committee in August and then I'll view in um, in September. Uh, this is an action item for the board and staff's recommendation is to adopt the six resolutions necessary to implement the 22-23 budget, preliminary budget. Uh, but before those questions, I just want to mention a couple of things. Um, in the document itself, the budget narratives and the, uh, the divisional budget narratives uh, have been substantially revamped to include not only the division descriptions, but also performance measures and goals. Uh, which is consistent with the direction you, know, you gave in your strategic plan. You wanted to see more of that integrated into uh, into our budgeting, so we're happy to add that in. Uh, I got great help from all the division budget officers across uh, uh, across the district in putting those together, as well as um, the finance team. And with that, the finance team specifically would like to recognize uh, Ron and Bedrad and Tara Mailer and Sarah Ortiz and the rest of the finance team who put together and worked on the budget. So with that. Includes my remarks and welcome your questions. Do I have any um, comments or questions from any um, directors? Just, just one. Go ahead. Um, and first, thank you for you and your team for the work that went into putting into the uh, preliminary budget. A lot of moving parts. One of the things that you had mentioned um, was lower involvement in the managed care plans. So is that essentially going to affect the headroom that's available in the IGT fund? So the we had been anticipating about 9.4 million annual on a straight line basis, and the 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 plans that are it has, has hasn't happened yet, but we use a firm that helps us forecast this. They anticipated that the the, in the reduction of one or two of the plans would result in, result in about a $700,000 decrease. That's something that we'll want to update you on in August and September too, because that program is evolving constantly in flux. It just seems like it's changed almost every year at some facet of the, the uh, system. And then uh, the eight million originally, that was the money for our non-federal match for the uh, IGT funds. Is that correct, or is that what was our non-federal share? The um, the amount, the, I don't know, make sure I'm looking, thinking of the right 8 million, 8 million in IGT funds. Well, you'd mentioned uh, 8 million in the, of the IGT, but that we didn't have that at the time. Was that for our, you know, that we have to put up the non-federal um, match? So um, that was net up. So we had put up, uh, uh, we had put up our share of the match and then the program was. I thought that sounded like a. A large share for it yeah, was well, yeah. Okay. We would have had eight million more in the IGT fund in March had that not happened. Okay. All right. Thanks. So my questions. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? All right. <clears throat> so this is an action item. So I will take a motion and a second on the first resolution number A. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we adopt uh, staff's recommendation for fiscal year 2022-23 preliminary budget. Mm -hmm. Resolution A, preliminary budget for the general operating funds, 212A. Also. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Madam mm -hmm. Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Director Gould. Aye. Borzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets? Aye. Kelly? Aye. Jones? Aye. White? Aye. Clark? Aye. And Sailors? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. For the next item, B, can I get a motion in a second, please? <laughs> yes, what did you guys say? <laughs> I make a motion that we uh, adopt this whole year 2022 preliminary budget resolution B, uh, preliminary budget for the capital facilities fund 212B. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Director Gould? Aye. Orzali? Aye. Wood? Aye. Sheets? Aye. Kelly? Aye. Jones? Aye. White? Aye. Clark? Aye. Ann Sailors? Aye. 
Madam Chair, I make a motion that we adopt fiscal year 2022-23 preliminary budget resolution C uh, grants fund 212G. Second. We have a motion and a second. Will you call the roll, please? Director Gould. Aye. Orzelli. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. And Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we adopt fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget resolution D uh, for the development uh, impact B fund 212 I. Second. We have a motion and a second. Will you call the roll, please? Director Gould. Aye. Borzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Did I hear you, Director Kelly? I didn't hear you. Oh, sorry. Aye. <laughs> Kelly, gotcha. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. And Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Madam Chair, I make, uh, I make a recommendation that we adopt uh, the recommendation for the fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget uh, resolution E for the leased properties fund 212L. Second. We have a motion and a second. Will you call the roll, please? Director Gould. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. And Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. All right. Lastly, I make a motion that we adopt uh, the recommendation for the fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget resolution F for the ITT fund 212M. Second. We have a motion and a second. Will you call the roll, please? Director Gould. Aye. Orange Alley. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. Ann Sailor. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. The next action item is number two capital improvement program plan. CFO Dave Tool. Here we go. Good evening again, Madam Chair, Board Members, Mark Chief Harms. Um, I am uh, presenting this item with Jeff Pryor, Chief Development Officer. And before I begin, um, actually, I will just jump right in. On February 24th, you gave uh, a final approval to the Capital Improvement Program Policy and directing the process and timing for establishing the district's first modern day Capital Improvement Program, or CIP. Uh, tonight, we're pleased to be able to present you the results of that direction, 22-23 CIP plan. In accordance with that, that policy, staff followed a deliberate process to solicit and, uh, uh, and gather projects, which you'll hear about momentarily from Jeff. Uh, that process included everything, uh, evaluating the merits of and comparing the merits of projects, prioritizing projects, aligning those priorities with funds available over the five-year period, and discussing uh, up, there, all, up to the ranks of the district. In terms of our briefing agenda, uh, six items here we wanna talk, uh, uh, Jeff will address the CIP nexus with the district strategic plan and other planning documents of the CIP. Um, roles and responsibilities in the CIP process, Jeff will cover that. Uh, I'll provide a short overview of the 2222-23 CIP document. Uh, Jeff will cover the project selection process and selections. And finally, I'll do the, I'll discuss the financing plan. With that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Thanks, Dave. Um, so I just want to take a second here and tell the board a little bit about uh, the why behind the CIP, why we did this, and the nexus between the 2020 strategic plan. And I'll uh, remind you of the, the 2009, end of 2019 discussions with the board in, in the workshop, where you had identified what I call five elements of the strategic plan, and specifically two of them uh, were called capital assets and financial management. So in my mind, this CIP and the way we set it up is in direct response to that request and, and desired outcome from the board. Uh, specifically in regard to capital assets, you asked us to create three categories, um, real property, vehicle apparatus, professional out, uh, equipment. And the desired outcome from the board was a comprehensive analysis for maintenance, repair and replacement. And secondarily, uh, within the financial management element, uh, one of the outcomes or categories uh, was called future projections. And again, the desired outcome was uh, the addition of multiple year projections and impact analysis 
for key annual budget. <laughs> the idea was we were presenting you uh, one year pieces specifically requested with uh, assets. Um, this now includes a component that looks out five years and just gives you a little more information when uh, the board is making those type of decisions. Um, so the CIP is really the integration and the connection of those two strategic uh, planning elements. Um, and is how the entire program is set up moving forward. Give me the next slide there. Um, so I do, since this is effectively a new process, and um, I do want to walk the board through how we see it working. Um, again, everything now is through the lens of what I call master planning documents. Um, we want to look at our service deliver, uh, de uh, delivery model, and we want to look at that through the lens of these four areas, real property, apparatus, equipment, and then just some projects just aren't going to fit well into those three categories where we do have this miscellaneous category um, where we can uh, introduce specialized type pro uh, projects to the board. And, um, and so, you know, that will be a part of the consideration. Um, since 2019-ish, uh, I have been hard at work in um, organizing all of these master plans. They really look at, again, service through a long range. Um, with some of these plans range from five to 40 years. Um, so we want to be able to take all that information, digest it, um, and then present it really in two categories. One category is a one-year plan that the board can consider as a part of the budget, and then a five-year outlook to think about what is coming down the line. Um, so the second part of this process is really intended for anybody to submit a project um, the, the name of this is a project initiation form or called PIF for short. Um, and our intent is to allow anyone that has a look at how our service delivery should work moving forward and a project associated, a capital project associated with that should be able to submit a project and have the uh, district consider it. Um, with that PIF, we are asking for backup document, uh, documentation related to costs procedures, policies, how it's gonna work, timing of acquisitions and so forth. All of that information has been provided to you in the PIF forms in the back of the CIP. Um, we then take those PIFs and put them into a one and five year plan, which is also included in the CIP. Um, that body of work is brand new and it is a lot of work. I just wanna make that clear. So what we have done is we have uh, asked Aaron Castleberry to take on that work. It is very similar to our grant application and the way it has to be managed in, in the process itself. So we think it's a nice tie there. Um, so Aaron put together those PIFs, put the one in five year plan, and that was the package that we submitted to finance, um, which was uh, in what you saw tonight in the one year plan. Again, we also do have that five year outlook. Um, that CIP is then um, collected as a matter of projects, and we take it to a CIP committee for review, uh, which includes the deputy chief of support services, finance, planning and development, fleet and purchasing. Um, what we recognized very early is the need for a project was going to far outweigh the available funds to complete those projects. So we wanted everybody that had a major role or responsibility in this process to weigh in in that prioritization. Um, so we effectively, in this time, I think we had about 40 projects. We sat down and tried to do an initial sort on them and then send that recommendation to the executive staff, which was the fire chief um, and the deputy chiefs for review and ultimately approval, recognizing that there may be other reasons to switch a couple of programs or projects around and include them. The one I use for the finance and audit committee was the copter three conversion um, in this in this uh, go around. Um, and ultimately that process is what the board saw tonight and is seeing tonight um, and it's for your consideration. So this is the uh, this is the capital improvement program uh, cover there, and um, uh, the CIP I just want to mention was 
was built in accordance with, or with following guidelines from the California Society of Municipal Finance Officers and, um, uh, and generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, the costs presented in the plan are tied to and related to the 22-23 uh, preliminary budget, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the plan total is 9.1 million. The sections are the introduction has, uh, has the organizational profile, including the directory of officials, uh, district-wide organizational chart, district profile, values and mission, uh, the CIP overview and summary section that provides the purpose and background of the CIP, explains the CIP planning, uh, uh, planning and development process like Jeff just described, uh, and summarizes the five-year capital needs. The financing section, financing plan, um, provides the capital budget overview and revenue assumptions and displays summaries by project type and revenue source. Uh, and a debt, has a debt service schedule and operating and maintenance cost by spending category. The capital projects detail by priority and type section provides the project details and sorts projects by type, such as land acquisitions, new construction, station remodels and expansions, uh, facilities replacement, repair and apparatus, um, PPE replacement and repair, repair and special projects. And finally, the appendices includes things like uh, the district's budgeting methodology, a budgeting calendar, uh, guide to funds, glossary, board resolutions, and sources and uses of funds. I apologize for that. So um, again, the project selection process, um, just want to over you, over, uh, to give you an overview of what this year looked like. Uh, 49 projects again, totaling 42 million. Again, we estimated in the budget that we'd have about eight to 10 millions to spend on this. Uh, so the, the prioritization was needed. Uh, it went through a three-step process. Um, first is strategic planning alignment. Um, if the project submitted hits one or specifically more of those master plans I described earlier, um, we gave it a higher score. Um, in some of these projects, they're hitting two, three, four of those categories. Um, so they get elevated real quick. Uh, the second uh, priority was regulatory compliance or reduction to operating expenses. Um, specifically, we have a lot of projects that are trying to resolve issues or matters of law, um, gender accommodations, ADA, um, and, and others. And then finally, um, if it's going to improve service delivery, obviously it's, it's gotta be a priority project. Um, so that is the scoring mechanism. Um, we then, uh, as I mentioned, ranked the projects one from 49. Um, that was done in the committee. And then um, project readiness obviously is a big part of that. Can we move tomorrow if it's funded and make sure that we deliver that within the fiscal year or the planning period? Um, and, you know, that's basically the recommendation to the fire chief and the deputy chiefs. So here is the, is your, is the funding recommendations. Um, uh, as I said, there's there's 12 projects that were selected, and totaling 9.1 million. There's the uh, your large dollar items that I previously mentioned in the preliminary budget. Of course, the 4.3 million of the Type One replacements, the nine ambulances, um, and then there's Copter Three again. So, in terms of the funding recommendations, funding sources, this slide is showing the same same information in a slightly different way. Um, you can see uh, circled at the top there are uh, are the, the type five engines and the ambulances that make up about 75% of the capital plan. Uh, sorry. sorry, I missed it. Dave's gonna punch me after this. I mixed up our notes, so now we're scrambling. Um, so we just wanted to give you a look at the five-year plan here um, and break them up in costs. Uh, just wanna make note here you know, it is $201.9 million uh, in proposed projects looking out five years. That is a big number to think about. 
Um, I do want to take a second here and uh, address an issue that Director Wood had brought up in the Finance and Audit Committee, uh, which is our increased reliance on debt service and uh, the concern about that. I just want to make note, because I think it's worth talking about here, um, that it is a current concern of all of ours. Um, now that we have the data and we are looking at this pretty big mountain to climb, um, you know, I just want to note going back to the strategic plan and specifically what the board had tasked me with was a finding every revenue source we can um, b categories categorizing all of this need and looking out five years and then c presenting kind of what do we do to take care of this issue. So I'm standing here telling you that we have turned over every rock related to revenues. Um, we're renegotiating leases. I think we have $60 million in grant ass out there. Um, we are trying to talk federal, state, local government into every dollar we can find. Um, we are updating our impact fees. There's just not a lot of blood in that turnip there. Um, the next step we have categorized this. So we spent a lot of time thinking about and talking about the use of that service. Um, and something for the board to think about and possibly discussion for the next strategic plan workshop is now some of these projects can't wait. I think we had some reasons to defer capital projects in the Great Recession and then in COVID as we were responding to the immediate need and service delivery. Um, but some of these projects will need to be addressed. Um, we thought at least for the timing of this first year, after a lot of conversations with our consultants, and where um, uh, uh, rates are right now, that it made sense in a very moderate amount uh, to use them for some of these issues. Uh, but again, just keep that in the back of your mind, something to talk about later. That, that's why the decision was, and I just wanted to make sure we address it. Uh, the funding recommendations for debt service are uh, Provided on this slide. The um, okay. Uh, finally, this table shows that the debt service over this the five year period uh, for uh, forty million in projects selected in this year's plan uh, includes everything that will be paid. This the the financing shown includes everything that will be paid over uh, more than one fiscal year, and the board in its strategic plan uh, directed vehicle for procurements uh, uh, through financing, and the district has been procuring much of its fleet through that process. So finally, in our questions slide, uh, before concluding, I just want to rec again recognize some staff who are not present here. Uh, Aaron's in the audience here. Recognize Aaron, but also Tara Mailer and Ron Empatrad, who worked uh, closely on this project. Um, now, this is another item for the board and my, uh, another action item for the board. My recommendation is to adopt the resolution and implement that. Welcome to questions. We have a question from Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to say I know this is a huge thing, and I appreciate, Jeff, all the work you did to put this together. Um, I know it's not like you're looking for things to do during your day, and this <laughs> took a lot of it. And I just want to, I know it's a team plan, but I know without you and Aaron and all the hours that were added to your normal workloads, um, this wouldn't have got done. So thanks for all that time. Appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. I'd also like to thank you for all the time and attention that went into uh, preparing this. It's always challenging when you have more funding requests than funds available. But you had mentioned, and I, you know, I know that's got to be a priority when you're talking about the regulatory requirements, like the OSHA mandated, you know, for, for PPE. But I didn't. That was number six, I think, on there. But I didn't see anything for SCBAs. Are we? you know, not in need of replacing cylinders in this next fiscal year or anything of that nature. Yeah. Our AFG grant in 2017 is still on Perfect. Yeah. As long as we're not trying to replace them all at the same time. No interior firefighting for the next month, but we have plans moving <laughs> forward. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments on this item? Seeing none. Thanks. Um, I will entertain a motion and a second. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we adopt staff's recommendation for the capital improvement program plan. I'll second it. We do have a motion and a second. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Director Gould. Aye. 
Orzelli. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. And Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. The next item, number four, has been removed from tonight's agenda. Moving on to item number five ratification of the resolution to extend the teleconference of board meetings, government code 54953E-3. Um, and what's been happening right now in the county, continue, uh, COVID continue, I'm sorry. Did I miss? Yeah, you skipped three. Yeah, skipped three. Oh, I did. Yes. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. <laughs> Let's go back. Item number three. Okay. Um, year end 2021-22 budget amendment. See, I followed day two. I thought you were done. Let's go back and do number three. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you again, Madam Chair and Board Members, Sawyer Chief Harms. Um, uh, this is an item without uh, PowerPoints, thank you. Uh, for this item, your approval is requested to shift 500,000 uh, from the labor account to the service and supplies accounts. Uh, this, uh, the amount requested is a, is a portion of anticipated savings at the end of this fiscal year. Uh, the transfer funds would be used for higher anticipated fuel costs, 87,000 for that, uh, increased utility costs, about 50,000 for that, and anticipated but not yet specified, just call inflation driven price increases we're expecting this month uh, 363,000. Um, additionally, the agenda item asks, uh, seeks approval to transfer $57,600 uh, from service and supplies to capital projects uh, for an EMS training simulator equipment purchase, which um, incidentally uh, was uh, budgeted in the wrong account and should have been, should have been a capital project. Uh, this proposal does not increase the level of expenditures you last approved in the mid-year budget. Uh, it's just moving funds between accounts. Uh, and from a point of historical perspective, uh, last year, uh, the, the, the labor budget was low and a $1.9 million transfer uh, was made from service and supplies to, um, uh, uh, to labor. Uh, this year, we're asking to go in the opposite direction, 500,000. Um, this is an agenda item for action and staff's recommendations to approve the attached resolutions uh, amending the fiscal year 21-22 general fund budget to reflect additional services and supplies expenditures and transferring funds to the capital facilities fund to facilitate a planned EMS equipment purchase. Okay. Any questions, comments? Can I get a motion Madam, in a second? Madam Chair, I move that uh, we adopt resolutions amending the fiscal year 2021-22 uh, general fund and, and uh, capital facilities fund. Second. We have a motion and a second. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Director Gould. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. And Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Okay, let's go to item number five now. Um, ratification of resolution to extend teleconference of board meetings, government code 54953E-3. Because of what's happening with COVID up there, the trend is moving upward in the numbers of new cases. As of June 7th, there were 3,088 new cases in Sacramento County with a seven day average of 1,082. As of June 6th, there were 169 hospitalizations just in Sacramento County alone with a seven day average, uh, yeah, with 20 of those patients in the ICU. Lastly, Sacramento County health officials advise all people to wear masks in indoor public places as the cases and hospitalizations increase around the region. So as COVID continues to stay with us, we are going to continue to offer Zoom meetings so that everyone has the choice to either come in, wear a mask, or join us on Zoom. Can I get a motion and a second to continue this item? I'll make a motion. A second. We have a motion and a second. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Director Gould. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. Ann Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. 
Moving on, the next item is reports. President's report, I have none tonight. Next up, Fire Chief's report. What Good evening, directors and everybody uh, here tonight. Thank you for the support, first off, for the 22-23 budget as we move forward. Uh, a couple of things. First off, congratulations to Joe Farika, who was promoted to Assistant Chief Sift Commander on A shift. His effective date was June 1st, so congratulations to Joe. Uh, secondly, on a retirement, congratulations to Engineer Dave Carrillo on his retirement on June 2nd after 19 years of service. Uh, we have a couple open recruitments right now for the Special Operations Battalion Chief for day assignment. Uh, geographic Information Data Analyst uh, is open, and we also have a Firefighter Paramedic Internal and External uh, process that is open right now. Uh, as Jeff said, is, is I think he said we had to turn over turnips, was it? Or search? <laughs> Blood of turnips is that we've spent the, uh, the last few weeks meeting with Citrus Heights Council members along with the Board of Supervisors as we updated our capital uh, facilities or impact fee study and being able to move that forward. Um, the relationships that we have with the supervisors on, uh, I think it was Tuesday, uh, they voted 5-0 to move our impact forward. There'll be another hearing or that was the hearing, there'll be another vote in two weeks on that there. So again, the relationships are very strong there. At the end of the month, we will uh, have the, the next meeting of the same night we have our meeting, Citrus Heights will have their meeting on our impact fees there also as we move forward. Um, the other big item that is going on is, as you know, every year, twice a year, I meet, try to meet with all the members. And usually it's in June and then uh, another time in November. Uh, we call those the chief's forms, myself and the deputies sit down. Um, we're usually able to do those in about 18 meetings. So earlier this week, we started those. Uh, as always, we talk about uh, the budget, the hiring, uh, promotions, uh, what's happening in the district as far as growth or as other questions from the members have. But one of the big items that we're talking a lot about this year are the 21 safer positions. So as you remember, in um, August of last year, we were awarded the grant for the 21 safer positions. It is unique that in the past, the uh, safer would pay about 70% and then the district would pay 30% and then the next year 50-50 and then the final year they would have some percentage in there. Uh, these positions are 100% covered for all three years and gave us a lot of flexibility to look at our operation and be able to put those people into place. So we hired that group in February. They started the academy. They'll graduate at the end of the month. They'll do their 10 shifts and they'll count as staffing in August then. Uh, August 1st. So it's very important to have a plan together for being able to move forward. So in February, we asked John Runicki uh, from the management side and Mike Gildon. I thought I saw Mike. Mike's in the back back there hiding. But uh, both John and Mike to uh, in a labor management committee is to look through our organization. And the first priority was to be able to have a plan for uh, the 21 safer positions, but also where do we want to be in five years? And so we knew we had really about three or four months. Uh, John and Mike did a great job of holding multiple meetings. Uh, they divided up the group. And if you remember, they came in and, and spoke to you all just quickly on uh, really operations, EMS, and then a special operations group. And so they came back and, and uh, last week they came in with a recommendation for the fire chief for moving forward. And when you look at it, some of the things they brought forward is if you look at 2021, um, we cracked over 100,000 calls and, and we're increasing call volume by about 5%. Uh, fire calls over the, the last two years have jumped 22%, 10% increase in structure fires, and a 30% increase in vegetation fires. Uh, we've had nine civilian deaths in the last two years in 2019 and 2020. Um, and we had a, a total of about $30 million in losses in 2020. So a very busy system for us that is out there and a very active system on the EMS side of what we do every single day. So Mike and John came forward with three recommendations for looking at the, the service delivery side of it. Uh, their first recommendation was to staff a full-time ambulance at Station 59. 
The second recommendation was to add a fourth member to uh, companies that had high call volume that also have a fire-based medic. And the last one is to add three positions to the air operations group out there. Uh, myself and the executive staff have gone through those things. Um, the first one, which was the staffing the medic out of station 59, has been a unique deployment for us for years. Is that station 59 will get a call, there's three members out there, they have an engine, they have ambulances, they have a water tender, a brush truck, I don't, they, they, every spot that's out there has something in it and they take the take and <coughs> uh, Once they respond on a call, Station 58 then has to move up to be able to cover. 58, another company has to be able to move up and cover out there. Um, overall, the population has grown across uh, the, the region, but out there in Rancho Marietta, it's been a population increase of 4.6%. Their call volume over the last few years has increased by 30%. Medic 59 now is averaging about 2.3, 2.5 calls a day or transports. So each time that happens, their average out of service time is an hour and 42 minutes. So you can see the impact that it's having on the system. So I think for all of us looking at that, uh, that's a pretty easy opportunity to put an ambulance out there for service and, and being able to keep some of the other companies in, in, in position. One of our members that was in one of the chief's forms that's living out there and uh, Director White, I'm not real sure where they're going, but they they said that uh, they had just heard in a planning process that, that there's 700 new homes planned for that geographical area just over the short period of time here coming up. So we know that growth is going to happen out there with that. Um, the second side of this, when we look at a fourth company, fourth person on a company at the at the high volume stations, um, we're going to do three out of the four there. And there's a great advantage for, for the companies that go from three to four. And if you look at the fire side of it, uh, for the company officers, our, our, our folks do a great job. Uh, as a company officer, a lot of times they have to focus on what I would call the tactical level of seeing what is going on in the fire ground and giving direction. But it has to also be involved with the task level, making sure the hose line moves forward. Uh, by adding that fourth person, it gives them an opportunity to uh, be able to look at the uh, fire ground and then still have enough people uh, allows them an opportunity in those busy stations with an ambulance to rotate people around it gives them an opportunity to take people and do training mentoring allows someone that wants to take the engineers exam to move up to a position and give some flexibility i think the the biggest thing that we have seen is that um, discussions with our members is just that there's so many stations that could benefit by a fourth person mm -hmm. And so this is just our, our snapshot right now for being able to do that. Um, the last one that we're going to do, and we'll talk about the support of the air operations and in the budget that just went through, we will support air operations, but we're going to support it in a different way. The last one we're going to do is we're going to look at a concept of, of putting a squad in place. And our concept of the squad is a two person vehicle. Uh, it will be staged at a uh, location or be assigned to a location that has a high volume of calls. Um, fire stations, and, and for us here, if you take like station 53 or station 24, uh, they will run 4,500 calls possibly in this next year. Uh, ideally, companies, once they hit 3,500 calls, what you start to see is a decrease in opportunity. So the normal company goes to work, uh, they check out their rig, they clean the fire station, uh, they plan their day to be able to do training with their crews, uh, be able to do PT, uh, go out in their first do and, and prepare themselves for familiarization out there. Once you go over about 3,500 calls, what you start to see is things start to drop off. And so people get there and they check their rig, but they don't have time to clean the station because they are running calls. And, they want to be able to do a drill, but the call volume is so high is that they don't have that time where they have to work with their battalion chief to be able to do it. So by putting a, a squad and looking at the uh, deployment of the EMS side of it, um, it looks at how do we take and reduce that call volume then for those companies there. So can you reduce it where you have a squad and both of the companies are running um, 3,000 calls instead of one company running 4,500? Uh, the squad concept was something that Mike and John and the committee had brought forward as an opportunity. 
but at the time had looked at, you know, where do we put it at? What's the equipment we're going to put them on? Some challenges. But I really think with the, the positions we have, this is a great opportunity to see what we can do as far as an impact on call volume. Um, in my prior life in Phoenix, there's a fire station um, that has two engines in it. We added a third engine and two ambulance, and all three of those companies are running over 4,000 calls. What you'll see is some of those first dues just have so many calls that there's an impact that you still are running it. But what you get out of it is that the companies around there then see a decrease in call volume. So I think if you take a station or like 24s and you you put a, a squad there, it's an opportunity for us to run, a, run it and, and run it as a pilot program and see what the impact is. Uh, over the next 60 days, Chief Mitchell is sitting there in the front, Chief Mitchell, along with the input of, of labor and, and John Runicki, and need to come up with some uh, some guidelines for the squad that we will be able to work with, work with our partners uh, in the region here, and then being able to move forward and see what that impact is on those companies to truly reduce response time, reduce out of service time, reduce companies and from going from one first due to the next, but staying in their first due as they go forward there. So it is to me, the, the pilot and, and the other options here are, are very exciting. Uh, the last one, just to talk about air operations, I think that uh, uh, the budget that you just approved, there is a, what I would say is the full load of what we would say as far as the overtime that is needed. There is a captain's position that's a pro program manager. Uh, there are just some other opportunities now that we have three aircrafts. And as you saw in the presentation, there's an opportunity for Copter 1, Copter 2, and now to upgrade Copter 3, that they are all three exactly the same. And what we'll get out of is how do we shut down the program in December, and then it's closed for about four months, and then we have to restart it back up again, is that we made uh, stability through that program all the way through there and, and working with the group over there moving forward. So exciting times. We will have some goals uh, that are laid out. Um, uh, we have some, obviously, some challenges. Uh, Chief Wagman's going to find us a, a rig. He was texting me pictures of a possible rig earlier today, but I don't think it's going to work out. Uh, but we'll figure those things out and then really look out at like station 59 and look at the impact and look at the impact of the additional folks on those companies that are uh, really our busiest companies that we have in our system. So that ends my report for tonight, unless you have any questions for me. Madam Chair, I have a question. Thanks Chief for all the numbers there on the SAFER grants. And uh, Chief Mitchell, thank you for all that work. Uh, can am I do we have the 21 safer grants that's how many we have yeah we have 21 spots? positions okay could you add uh tell me where those positions are actually going you had uh, two at, at meta 59 we're going to upgrade from three to four on three engines mm -hmm. and one how squad. many squads one squad with two people okay um, where are all the rest of the folks going to be able all three shifts, three so shifts. seven per shift seven yeah. fourteen okay, so that adds it up thank you mm -hmm. does anyone else have any questions for the chief just a comment that um, i appreciate the recognition of the significant residential developments in both the north and south side of the community out there plus you know there's still homes being built outside the Gate. I know there's growth throughout the district, but um, you know the consideration of, of staffing that ambulance full time, I think, is something that uh, I'm glad to see. Um, you know, I can't necessarily say proactive, but you know, from a standards to cover perspective and the time on task, given their transportation distances, I, I really uh, applaud the district's um, movement towards staffing that ambulance. So thanks. All right. Moving on to operations report. Good evening, DC Mitchell. Madam Chair, good evening, directors, Chief Arms, and everybody here. Um, give you a few items here for the operations report. First off, we'll start off with the statistics. As we were talking about there, we ran a total of 4,279 total incidents since our last report, um, which is an average of over uh, 305 calls per day. So, still very busy out there, as we would expect. By incident type, 66% of those were EMS related, which is right on what we would expect to have at that percentage. 
I will say that there was 206 fire incident types that were responded to during that time, which averages about 14 fire incident types per day. So that's continuing to remain high. We expect to see that as we move into the wildland fire season here as, as stuff dries out, things tend to burn more. So um, we, are, we are seeing that increase. Uh, next, I just wanna um, say thank you to a number of folks that recently um, put on our AutoX training out at the Zinfandel Training Center. You may have seen some of the coverage on the news. Firefighter Jason Watts, his cadre of highly qualified folks, as well as the training division, logistics, and many others, assisted to put on that uh, multiple day training event out there. That's really it's an advanced auto extrication, heavy wreckers involved. I don't know if you saw the car hanging off the building um, on the news, if you've watched that segment. Fantastic job. They've done that for a few years. We're looking forward to the opportunities in the future to expand that out to more, more of our partners out there and what that brings, because it really is high quality training you don't see very often um, throughout the state. So thank you to them. In addition to that, um, our CERT members were out there for uh, that whole entire class. We had 15 of them that were out there and they put in a total of 168 hours, <clears throat> excuse me, of training, of, of support to that training. They were out there providing water and, and those kinds of things to our members. So thank you again to the CERT folks as well. Uh, we mentioned the Academy uh, coming to um, getting later and later here and getting closer to graduation. We have 37 recruits um, still out there. They're getting close. Uh, this is week 15 of 18. And appropriately, as I mentioned before, with the drying fuels, I was out there today. Um, they were in their wildland gear doing make and break evolutions and extending progressive hose lays. Fortunately, came around the corner and they had a nozzle pointer right at me, but they were nice enough not to hit me in the windshield. Um, but they're out there doing that. Um, a couple of adjunct instructors that came in. Um, Captain Aiello um, is out there and helping out because um, he's qualified to teach that. So again, thank you to those members that are getting, getting a, our newer folks ready to go for the season ahead. Um, and then also our training division, EMS division, and on-duty crews are facilitating our lateral firefighters from 21-2 through their six-month probationary evaluation process, which is going very well. We're almost done with that. A couple of large incidents to highlight tonight. Um, on this, the 1st of June, we had a number of companies respond to a structure fire up on Hoffman Lane and Hoffman Lane in Orangevale. Um, very heavy fire conditions, um, some challenges there. It was hot. Um, there was void spaces between a number of different roof types. It was a very challenging incident. Um, this, the home did sustain significant fire damage, but two items of note for that as far as what the residents there um, uh, gave us a lot of thanks for. One is there was a classic GTO vehicle that was in the garage, and we were able to get that out of there undamaged. It was uninsured, and so the homeowner was very appreciative of that. Um, but also um, our crews went in after and did part of their salvage operations and they were able to remove a number of the occupants' belongings, including some of the children's sports uniforms. And the kids started crying because it was something that was very special to them. So thank you to the crews out there for that great work. And then the second incident was on the 6th of June in Nelda Lane. It was actually not in our district. It was in the Herald Fire District, which we um, provided automatic aid to. It was a 26-acre fire in the end. Um, structures were threatened and um, damaged. Our crews responded. We had the copter, dozer, both uh, 358, Water tender 58, 359 water tender, battalion 9, and AC 24 all responded there just due to the complexity of the incident and the growth. Um, Herald Fire and Cal Fire were also there, so it was a very large response as we would expect to see in those uh, rural areas where the fires are starting to grow larger. Um, but one of the uh, notable items that we were able to do proactively was put a battalion chief and five engines um, heading them out to slew house to stage because it looked like that incident was going to grow and potentially have some more evacuations and things fortunately they were able to get control of it but we did have a full strike team ready to go to help our partners to the south so very proud of our crews for being able to get to that very quickly and be ready to go when needed um so they did spend a lot of time out there doing mop up obviously with all of that acreage burning and within the houses and the different fuel types um, so very good job. We're in that season now. My, our phones are going off a lot more with those vegetation fire incidents as we would expect. We're hoping to keep them as small as possible through the season. So that's it for the ops report tonight, unless there's any questions. Any questions? Thank you very much. You. Next up is Firefighters Local 522 reports. Matt Cole. <clears throat> Good evening, board members and everybody in the room. Um, first off, I'd like to congratulate Dave Crillo on his retirement after 19 years of service and wish him well in his future endeavors. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the folks on the service delivery team. Mikey's in the room, but the other 35 plus people that have been working on that are not here. 
Um, and they've been taking their own time. They've been all over the fire district. They've been at headquarters. They've been talking with division heads. They have really like turned over all kinds of stones to be able to provide this recommendation to the chief. And we're excited about the opportunities that this is going to present for us to continue to increase our service to the community. So thanks again to everybody. Um, and I couldn't even stand here and list everybody, so I'm not going to try to. And that's not a complete admission. Like this is really just section one. Um, Barbie, uh, Chief Law, sorry, is in the room, and she was a key component of that, looking at our ambulance deployment. And um, everybody from, from Jeff Fry and Aaron just helping us understand the safer grant and, and really like the projections that are already in place. We couldn't reinvent the work that's already gone in there. Not we're not pretending to, but from our perspective, having the opportunity to look at this and give a recommendation was fantastic. So thank you to absolutely everybody. Um, the last few months we've been really busy uh, out in the community, not just looking at what this delivery might look like, but also working with some of our community members specifically um, who support this training center opportunity that we have in front of us. Uh, most recently, we've been really active with some of the primary elections coming up, making sure that those that support us in this, we support. And so um, I'm really happy where that stands. I can tell you, and I think I spoke to it with a number of folks, maybe in the last board meeting, um, my days all run together, but we stood and supported uh, local 2881. Their president, Tim, was very appreciative of that. Today, he wrote a letter saying that Cal firefighter fighters absolutely support this opportunity, not just ours, but the city of Sacramento's ask as well. And that these two opportunities in the county um, will be great for Cal Fire firefighters because they will come train with us as well. So mathematically, that gives us darn near a third of the firefighters in the state when you look at how many folks in SPI 22 are also support, support this as well as local 55 and Alameda County. So that's really important to us. Like this is a huge benefit, not just to Metro Fire, but to so many folks that to have that support lining up. Um, it's fantastic. And so uh, I think what that really speaks to is what's good for one is good for all in the fire service and not just firefighters, but our community. Um, and so the firefighters here, though we say a lot that we serve and protect the community, we're actually a part of the community and always have been ever since the first volunteer department way back when grabbed their buckets and ran down the street to help their neighbor. So um, we've been working tirelessly on things like the service delivery committee. We've been working on coming up with solutions to our staffing challenges. Um, we've, we've talked at length about all of the challenges the last two years have presented and how unique they are. Um, but we have members running more calls than ever facing new challenges that we've never faced before with a world that is unfortunately fairly violent at times. The mental health uh, impact on our membership, like. None of that is lost on us, I, I know. Um, and we're all working together to come up with solutions. So to the 522 members in the room and on Zoom, um, we hear your frustrations. We see your fatigue. We as your labor reps, but also the board and management, like we are working to ensure that Metro Fire is the best place for you to call home. We hear you. And I want the representatives of the community in the room and those that may be on Zoom or maybe watch this later to know that we will always be here for our communities, no matter what challenges we face. We are 100% committed to that. And we thank you for the trust that you give us in that. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Okay. Next up is committee and delegate reports. Um, for the executive committee, I have no report tonight. <clears throat> Communication Center JPA. Uh, DC Wagman. Thank you. California Fire and Rescue Training JPA Chief Harms. Our very last meeting will be June 22nd. June 22nd. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Finance and Audit Committee Director Orzali. Uh, the Finance and Audit Committee did not meet. Our next scheduled meeting is June 23rd. And that completes my report. Thank you. Policy Committee, Director Gould. No report. Thank you. Next up is board member questions and comments. And we shall start with Director Jones. Oh. I'm always first up to bat. No I worries. Know. I know. Hey, um, Madam Chair, I have no comments for tonight. Uh, I do want to thank everyone for all of the reports and great information about the uh, safer grant deployments. Uh, I've been looking forward to seeing that finalized. So I guess I did have a couple of comments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Kelly. 
I just wanted to say happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the world. Hope you guys all enjoy a good weekend. Thank you, Director Kelly. Director Sheets. Good evening. I just want to thank uh, everyone for their reports and um, presentations tonight. Uh, great information. Uh, I wanted to extend my gratitude to Station 106 uh, for their hospitality last week. Uh, and I too wanted to wish all the fathers uh, a happy Father's Day. That's all. Thank you. Director Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first off, I just want to comment that I'm really happy to hear that 59 uh that resolution looks like it's going to happen that uh, ever since uh my first ride along in the district was with uh bc chris seiler in 2013 and um you pointed out the risks and the dangers that occur when that move up and you have the one person left behind in that station waiting for that that move up and it's always been a, a fear of mine and what do you do what's what's that firefighter going to do that's just sitting back in that station waiting when a call comes in even though they're training and everything says you wait, They're, these aren't the type of people that don't, that would wait. They're gonna go in and put themselves at risk even though they know better. So I'm glad to hear that we're gonna, we're taking care of that issue. And uh, that's good to hear for the safety of our members. I also wanna say thank you to uh, everyone who uh, was at 68. Um, I appreciate the um, hospitality you guys extended my wife in my absence. I wasn't able to make it, I was out of town unfortunately. So. Uh, Aaron, thanks for all the hospitality you gave her and everyone else. So thank you. Thank you. Director Rosali. Very briefly, I just wanted to thank Mr. Fry and Mr. O'Toole for the work they've done on uh, this uh, capital improvements uh, project. Great piece of work, definitely needed and something we greatly appreciate. Thank you. Director Gould. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, echo what Randy just said about the CIP. Uh, I, it's a wonderful document, lots of time and energy. So thank you to everyone that was involved in the leadership and the development of that plan. We look forward to sharing that with our partners and community, even more than has already been done. Um, also like to see if there's an opportunity for board members to get access to the document that was provided relative to the service delivery update and recommendations. I, for one, would like to see those. And so if we can uh, request that, uh, that members get access to that of the uh, board of directors. Uh, and then um, thank you very much. As a father, I look forward to copious amounts of gifts from all of my children. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Director White. Well, I just want to, you know, echo a lot of the sentiments that have already been said tonight about all the the work and energy that's gone into the reports of the CIP and also the service delivery um, recommendations. Really appreciate everybody that uh, is focusing on better service delivery and, and keeping the district running. Um, and then I wanted to make mention that on May 28th, we lost a, a very big supporter of the fire service, a very unique individual, uh, Randy Brink. Um, he served as a equipment manager for the fire dogs for 20 years, and as well as numerous other uh, capacities. He is somebody that absolutely loved Sacramento and Sacramento loved him. And uh, his memorial service will be held Tuesday, January 21st at River Cat Stadium, uh, Sutter Health uh, Park at 4 p.m. At June? Uh, no, this, uh, yeah, June, wait up, we're in June. You say January. So they have June, Tuesday, June 21st at 4 p.m. And so if we could have a, a moment of silence, silence to tonight, that'd be great. That's very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wright. Director Clark? Yes, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for their uh, presentation and reports and um, thank the men and women of Metro Fire for the job well done. That's all I have. That's all you have. Mm -hmm. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else has been said. So. Yes. <laughs> last. And being last, I would just like to thank all the members for continuously showing up and serving this district and um, this county of Sacramento and the small part of Placer County that we serve. And with that,
um, we will go to closed session. And yeah, let's do the one minute, the one, the moment of silence for Randy. Um, Randy was a very special person. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Recording stopped.